Good afternoon. My name is Emer Cook and I am the Executive Director of the European Medicines Agency. It's a pleasure for me to open this third public meeting and to welcome both everyone to this live broadcast and those who have joined the virtual meeting room. This is another opportunity for us to give you the latest updates on our work in combating COVID-19 and also to listen to your comments, questions and concerns. This meeting builds on the positive feedback we have received from our previous two public meetings. Today, we will pro provide information on the continued assessment, approval and safety monitoring of COVID-19 vaccines. We will also update you on our transparency measures, including the publication of the clinical trial data that we have evaluated. We will also address the expected impact at a community level. And to present this aspect, I'm very pleased to have the contribution from the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, the ECDC. As I'm sure you know, the ECDC is another EU agency with which we are actively collaborating as part of Europe's response to the pandemic. Vaccines are a crucial tool, critical tool to help us to return to normal life. Today, thanks to the progress in medicines and technology, the unprecedented mobilization of resources and a huge amount of international collaboration, we've seen the full process of vaccine development and approval, which usually takes more than 10 years. We've seen this now compressed to less than a year. And it is by offering safe and effective vaccines to the public in a record time that we hope to see a positive impact on the course of the pandemic. Four COVID-19 vaccines have been approved in the EU so far, Comirnaty, Moderna, AstraZeneca, and very recently the Janssen vaccine. Data from three more vaccines are under rolling review. Uh, this is our process where we, we have an ongoing review of the data before the final data can be submitted. The three vaccines are CureVac, Novavax, and Sputnik V. But every day we receive questions like, how were these vaccines evaluated and approved? How do they work? How safe are they? What is the experience so far in member states? So this meeting today will address many aspects of these questions together with others that you may raise during the question and answer session. The opportunity to listen to you, patients, citizens, doctors, nurses, pharmacists is very important for us. Your input during these meetings helps us to determine what more we can do to deliver our mission and how we can enhance public trust in vaccines and their vital role in overcoming this disease. The safety of vaccines is of the highest priority for us. The EU's pharmacovigilance system is robust and capable of a very rapid response. As you are aware, our safety committee is reviewing cases of blood clots reported in some people vaccinated with AstraZeneca vaccine. The committee has already concluded that the benefits of this vaccine outweigh its risks, but we still need to understand better. You'll hear more about this today. Further studies and close monitoring continue, including a dedicated expert consultation and meeting next week. Access and availability of these new vac vaccines remains a challenge. In addition to enabling fast approval processes, EMA is also working to facilitate the inclusion of additional manufacturing sites. Adding new manufacturing sites helps to upscale production capacity and increase the supply of vaccines in the European market. I'd like to emphasize that EU the EMA, that in the EU, the EMA is only one of the actors in the vaccination effort in the EU. We provide the scientific recommendations that underpin the safe and effective use of the vaccine. But other agencies like ECDC monitor the pandemic and provide information on the virus and variants circulating and the current situation and risk levels. EMA's scientific recommendations are the foundation upon which individual EU member states design and implement their own national vaccination campaigns. These may differ from country to country depending on the individual needs and circumstances. 
different countries may have different infection rates. They may identify different priority populations. They have, may have different pressure on their hospitals. They may have different vaccines availability. There's lots of differences. There's lots of different national circumstances that may influence uh, how vaccines are rolled out across the EU. Our mission continues and will continue so that more vaccines of the highest quality as well as better treatments are approved. And once approved, we will continue to take every effort to ensure they remain safe and effective. So with that, I'd like to hand you over to uh, my Deputy Director, Executive Director, Noel Wathian, who will be moderating this event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emer, uh, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I would also welcome you to this uh, third public stakeholder meeting, which I will be uh, moderating. As already explained uh, by Emer, uh, this meeting will provide you a further update on key aspects of the assessment, the approval, the safety monitoring, as well as the anticipated impact of the four COVID-19 vaccines that we have been um, uh, that we have approved at this moment in time: Comirnaty, Moderna. AstraZeneca and Janssen or the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Our aim is, uh, as we have been doing in the previous meetings, to present this information in an as public friendly manner as possible so that it can be understood by as many people as possible. Uh, the way that we will be running this meeting is also similar to what we have been doing in the past. So we will first have four presentations on four important topics. The first presentation will be an update um, on approved and candidate COVID-9 vaccines in the EU and will be given by Marco Cavalerius, our Head of Biological Health Threats and Vaccine Strategy at uh, EMA. The second one will be given by Peter Orlet, who is Head of Data Analytics and Methods at the agency and will be on vaccine safety monitoring with an update on emerging data since the EU authorizations. The third one will be by Eduardo Colzani, who is the principal expert vaccine preventable diseases at ECDC, who will provide a um, presentation on uh, expected impact of COVID-19 vaccination in the European Union. And finally, we'll move on to the topic of transparency and, and publication of clinical data for COVID-19. And that presentation will be given by Melanie Carr, who's head of stakeholders and communication division at the agency. We then will break for a short while, five minutes, and the second part of the meeting will be dedicated to listening to all of you and to responding to the views and the questions uh, that you may have, you members of the pub public, including patients, citizens, healthcare professionals, academics, and we also have invited some industry representatives. So without further delay, I'll now pass the floor to Marco Cavalieri for the first presentation. Over to you, Marco. Thank you very much, Noel, uh, and good afternoon to all of you. So in my presentation, as I said, I will go through very briefly in giving you an update of where we are with the uh, uh, candidate COVID-19 vaccine, in particular those approved, but also talking a little bit about what is the outlook. Next slide. And indeed, I will cover different points that will highlight some of the main features around the benefit risk of this vaccine and other aspects such as real world evidence studies in children and what we expect will be the impact of these vaccines on this pandemic. Next slide. I will start with a summary slide that tells you a little bit what has been happening throughout this year, and just to remind you, the pandemic was declared mid-March last year in 2020. So it's more than one year they are worrying to this pandemic, and we still have a lot of work to be done. But just to say that even before the pandemic was declared by the WHO, the EMA proactively established a task force bringing together all the expertise in the European network in order to make sure that we can give a rapid response and facilitate the development of vaccines and therapeutic for tackling this pandemic. And throughout last year, we had gone through a huge amount of conversation with developers in order to discuss all their plan, the design of the clinical trial, and to make sure that uh, 
really rapid feedback on regulatory aspects is given, and this is for the benefit of vaccines and therapeutics that can be approved as rapidly as possible. And I'm very glad also to say, as it is illustrated in this slide, that four vaccines have been approved so far. Next slide. So these four vaccines are divided in two different type of technologies. Comirnaty, so the first one that was approved on the 21st of December 2020 uh, is being developed by Pfizer and uh, BioNTech. And the Moderna one, which was approved a few days later, are vaccines that are based on the messenger RNA technology. So in other words, they are based on the small molecule, which is the messenger RNA, which contains the instructions and the code for producing the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the virus that is causing this pandemic. And uh, as you know, the spike protein is a key protein on the surface of the virus that allows this virus to be spreading into our body, infect and damage the cells, particularly of our lungs, but not only. So this was the mechanism that is being used by this vaccine in order to allow that the spike protein is produced into the cells in our body and then is expressed and released, and this cause an immune reaction that will give protection whenever in the future we will be encountering the virus. Other two vaccines have been approved, one from AstraZeneca and more recently one from Janssen, and you see here on the chart below, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine was approved on the 29th of January this year, and the Janssen one on the 11th of March. These two vaccines deliver the same message, but in a different way. So here the carrier is an innocuous virus, so a non-replicated adenovirus that enter into the cells and then into the cell, once into the cells, allows the cells to rebuild the spike protein, expose it to the immune system, and then trigger an immune reaction that will come for protection. So it's a different way, but at the end of the day, the message is the same. All these vaccines are able to confer immunity against one of the immunodominant uh, protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and allow us to be protected from infection from this virus. Next slide. Looking now into the benefits and the risk of these vaccines and starting from the efficacy side, and just let me remind you, everybody, that all these COVID-19 vaccines that have been approved in the European Union have an established positive benefit risk balance in the prevention of COVID-19 disease. And we have seen in clinical trials that the messenger RNA vaccines were really efficacious in very large clinical trials in preventing symptomatic COVID of any severity. Also, the viral vector vaccine demonstrated really high level of protection against symptomatic COVID. Often, there is the tendency of try to compare the results from all these different studies. However, we have to be careful in doing that because these vaccines have been studied all in different trials. Therefore, it is not so easy and it's not possible to make really direct comparison of the efficacy rates reported in these trials. And the reasons are multiple. It based on different geography where the trials have been conducted, different point, on point in times, different viruses that were circulating, including also the variants, different attack rates, and different definition of the symptoms that would trigger a PCR testing to really understand whether COVID-19 was happening. So again, we have to be careful. And we have to be mindful of the fact that in any case, all these vaccines demonstrated really high efficacy in the clinical trials. Data on prevention of severe disease, hospitalization and death from the clinical trials are limited despite the, the considerable size of these studies, but all are showing a trend toward high level of protection, which is extremely encouraging and extremely important as showing what could be the impact of these vaccines. We have now limited information from the clinical trials with respect to protection against emerging variants, but in a few minutes, I will give you more details of where we stand with that. Also, some real-world data with respect to prevention of infection and symptomatic disease have been reported, but also there, more data needed for proper estimation. 
But let me say that these data are extremely encouraging and would show that this vaccine not only have a big impact in preventing symptomatic COVID, but also in preventing infection. And I will give you more details in one of the next slides. Next slide. When it comes to safety overall, all these vaccines have shown a good safety profile, which is overall comparable to what we've seen with other vaccines that have been developed and are in use for preventing other infectious diseases. The most common side effects that have been detected are usually mild or moderate and temporary. These include pain, tenderness at the injection site, headache, tiredness, muscle pain, general feeling of being unwell, chills, fever, jump pain, and nausea. So the typical side effects that are related to what we generally call reactogenicity, which is very much something that we see with the majority of vaccines. On top of this, we have seen very rare but severe allergic reaction that have occurred in people receiving some of these vaccines. Uh, and these are occurring in less than one in 100,000 people. So they are very rare and there are good ways of taking care that there will be no, uh, uh, no problematic or consequences uh, after these occur. And therefore medical intervention can be put in place very rapidly in order to handle these events. Most recently, we have seen very rare events of severe thrombosis combined with thrombocytopenia after AstraZeneca vaccination, and they have occurred in around one in a million people. We don't know yet if these events are related to the vaccine, but we are investigating, and uh, Peter Arlett later on will talk to you more about this. Long-term safety is also being monitored, and we will continue to do that throughout months and years after vaccination. And lastly, on this slide, there is a reference to the full scientific details and product information for all these vaccines that is available on the MA website, and you're very free to consult them and get more information around what are the information for the prescriber and what was the scientific assessment that underpinned the evaluation and the approval of these vaccines. Next slide. As I mentioned, data from real world have been emerging and will be emerging in the future. And these data are quite important in order to complement the data that we have uh, uh, seen from clinical trials. And the real world monitor complements what is the MA regular safety monitoring activities as an important tool to detect anything that is happening from uh, the pharmacovigilance side. Real world data can inform vaccination campaign and could make changes in the current practices on how vaccines have been used or will be used. These studies in particular are providing and will provide information on how long protection lasts after vaccination how well the vaccine prevents severe COVID-19, how well it protects uh, vulnerable groups such as immunocompromised people and pregnant women, and whether it prevents asymptomatic cases and block transmission. As you know, this is a very important point to consider also in light of what will be the overall public health measure that will have to be put in place in the long term and by when we would expect to return to normality and really end this pandemic once and for all. Next slide. In terms of the preliminary data that we have seen around the real world evidence, there have been at least four studies that have been made available in the literature and they are coming essentially from Israel and the United Kingdom. We have done a preliminary assessment of all these studies and uh, we felt that these early data are indeed promising. Uh, the data coming from Israel using the Comirnaty vaccine are showing that this vaccine is able to prevent infection on top of symptomatic disease and severe disease, which is a very important uh, evidence that is coming up. And as indeed, we are really glad to see that the prevention of infection is very high. And also studies from the United Kingdom are showing that both the AstraZeneca and the Comirnaty vaccine uh, substantially reduce the risk of hospitalization. We are talking about more than 80% efficacy in this respect, but these are preliminary data and uh, more uh, will be coming that will be extremely important to get 
more solid ground in this respect. What this data are telling us that overall for the messenger RNA vaccine, the efficacy from the clinical trials as seen after the second dose has been shown also in these effectiveness studies, which corroborate the importance of giving a second dose with the messenger RNA vaccine. With respect to the AstraZeneca vaccine, the initial data that we have uh, looked into are showing really high level of protection from COVID, including severe disease after a first dose. And these are also important information that complement what we know already from clinical trials. And also, as you know, uh, a large clinical study that is uh, ongoing in the Americas has delivered some preliminary results that were made public by AstraZeneca this week. And this data will point to really high level of efficacy in the prevention of symptomatic COVID-19, including in the elderly, which as you know, was something that was missing in the initial clinical trials that supported the initial approval of this vaccine. So really good news on the way also in this respect. Next slide. Let's talk a little bit about studies in children. Uh, at the moment, as you know, uh, there are uh, no uh, vaccine approved uh, for younger children. The only one that has an, an approval for any pediatric population is the Comirnaty vaccine, which can be given above 16 years of age while all the other vaccines are approved just for adults above 18 years of age. Uh, the vaccines, uh, as always happen, have been tested first in adolescents and then progressively they will go down with age with clinical trials that will recruit children below 12 years of age in a, in a stagger approach. Now, we don't know exactly when this data will be submitted because the studies are ongoing, but we already heard that at least for some of these vaccines like Comirnaty, probably the data in adolescents will be available very soon. And we are really looking forward to assessing them and see whether we can authorize also this vaccine for uh, the adolescent population as a whole. And uh, we are also looking into uh, what the other vaccine will be doing in terms of pediatric development so that we can really understand as soon as possible whether the benefit risk of the, this vaccine will be positive also in the different pediatric populations. Next slide. A few words now about the other vaccines that are in the pipeline that have not yet been approved but already started the rolling review. As you know, the rolling review is a system that we have in place in order to speed up the development of promising vaccine after we receive sufficient evidence that the vaccines are promising and indeed there are good chances they may end up being approved. So the first one that I will mention is a vaccine developed by a company called Novavax and you see here written the code of this vaccine. This vaccine uses a more traditional technology, so it's based on the actual protein of the spike uh, that uh, is uh, put together with an adjuvanting system, which is essentially a small molecule that help boosting the immune response so that the immune response is stronger and able to protect in a better way from exposure to the virus. And this vaccine, as you know, already presented in the public result from clinical trials which appear to be extremely promising. So we are looking forward advancing with the evaluation of these vaccines in the coming weeks. Next slide. Another vaccine that is under development and quite advanced is the one from CureVac. Uh, it started also rolling review in February this year. It's another messenger RNA vaccine. So it contains the messenger RNA information for the spike protein contained in lipid nanoparticles, similarly to what we're seeing for Comirnaty and the Moderna vaccine. And right now, as we speak, there is a large clinical trials recruiting subjects in Europe and in South and Latin America that we really hope will reach good result pretty soon so that we can swiftly move on with the potential approval of this vaccine as well. Next slide. A third vaccine for which we started the rolling review is the, the Sputnik vaccine developed by Gamaleya. Uh, this vaccine started the rolling review not long ago, so a at the beginning of March. It's a vaccine that is based on the adenovirus concept, similarly to Janssen and AstraZeneca. 
However, it uses two different adenoviruses, and these two different adenoviruses are the carrier that contain uh, uh, the code for the spike protein, but they are not given simultaneously. So first uh, subjects will receive a dose of the adeno-26 vector, and after three weeks, they will receive a booster with the adeno-5 vector. In this way, they are able to boost even a stronger immune response and potentially high level of protection as well. And again, also with this vaccine, we are engaging with the company and looking forward defining a timetable that could allow to come up with the approval of this vaccine in a timely manner. Next slide. One important concern that has been emerging since few months now is uh, what is going to happen with the variants. As you know, as all viruses, also the SARS-CoV-2 uh, can change over time. And we have seen that indeed this virus has been changing quite a lot since has been uh, coming up as a human virus. And uh, this is something that is not surprising and we have to expect that. So it's very important that we continue to monitor how the virus evolves over time. And, uh, and very importantly, that we monitor the performance of the vaccine to make sure that all the vaccines that we have are still able to protect from all the variants that might be emerging over time. And uh, in order to be proactive together with developers, we are already working on the possibility of coming up with new version of the approved vaccines that take into account any of the variants that will be considered or major concern or that might be causing a high burden of disease in the European Union. And uh, we think that with this proactive work, we can be ready then to rapidly approve the such new vaccine uh, whenever we have sufficient evidence. And in this sense, we have come up with a guidance to developers that really describe what we would expect to be seen in terms of clinical development and pharmaceutical development for this new variant vaccine. And let me say that we do not need large clinical trials. So essentially, in a way that is similar to what we've been doing for decades with the influenza vaccines, what we would expect is to see a comparison of the immune response of the new variant vaccine against the variant virus to the original vaccine against the original virus. And if the immune response is consistently similar, then we believe that the vaccine will be able to confer the same level of protection and will be therefore approved. Next slide. What do we know right now about the performance of the vaccines that are already approved against these variants? There are some clinical trials that have shown that uh, some of these vaccines, at the very least, are able to protect from some of these variants, in particularly the, the B117 variant that is circulated in the European, European Union and in the United Kingdom. And that there we have seen clinical trial data that really show that some of these vaccines will protect in the same way as they do against uh, the original strain. And uh, we got also some data in terms of real world evidence that showed that also the messenger RNA vaccine are able to protect exactly in the same way against this variant. As you know, there are other variants that have been emerging from various parts of the world, in particular the B1351 that is emerging in South Africa. And we have seen there from some clinical trials that some of the vaccines will be very good in protecting from COVID-19 of any severity, while others may uh, lose some of their protection against uh, mild disease. But at the end of the day, the data that we have would suggest that all vaccines should still be able to protect against severe disease against also these variants. And also data from the laboratory are showing that in many cases, there is cross neutralization of the antibodies. So the antibodies are able also to neutralize these variants, even if maybe with the, a bit less efficiency, but still to a level that is supposed to confer the same level of protection. And a similar discussion could be done with respect to the other variant that has emerged from Brazil, which is the variant called the P1, for which we don't have clinical data available, 
but the data in the laboratory are supportive of the fact that most vaccines will come for good protection against this variant too. Next slide. There are a number of pending questions that are very important in the context of the mass vaccination campaigns that are taking place uh, today. Uh, one of the questions that has been coming up repeatedly is whether we need two doses for individuals who had a history of COVID-19. And some studies have already shown uh, preliminarily that in many cases, probably a single dose would be sufficient, as indeed uh, uh, two doses will not confer any additional benefit in terms of the immune response that can be achieved after the first dose. However, we do recognize that this population is very heterogeneous and the new response to the natural exposure to the virus can be extremely variable. Therefore, for us as regulators, it's very difficult to come up as yet with any clear-cut recommendation in this respect. Another question that has emerged repeatedly is around the interval between the two doses and with the shortage of supply that we have right now, some public health authorities have decided to wait before giving the second dose a bit longer than what has been done in the clinical trials. And also here, we don't have really good clinical data or real world evidence that would suggest how long you will be protected after a single dose of a messenger RNA vaccine. And therefore, we would like to caution around not extending too much the interval between the two doses, at least for the messenger RNA vaccines, while some flexibility, of course, would be well understood. A different discussion would apply to the viral vector vaccine because there, as you know, with the AstraZeneca clinical trials, there are data really supporting the fact that you could give the second dose much longer, even after 12 weeks. And this is what is included in the product information of this vaccine. And as you know, the Janssen vaccine has been developed as a single shot vaccine. So the idea is to give it only once, at least in the context of this emergency situation. But we are looking forward to see more data in this regard. Another important aspect that has been emerged has been in order to facilitate flexibility in the vaccination campaign, can you give the second dose of another vaccine than the vaccine that uh, was initially administered? And that the concept of going into this kind of heterologous boosting is really appealing. But unfortunately, for the time being, we don't have sufficient clinical evidence in order to make any clear cut recommendation from the regulatory standpoint. But we look forward working with developers and public health agencies and other stakeholders to see if data can be generated and whether this could inform how to use this vaccine during these campaigns. Lastly, but importantly, the use in vulnerable group, particularly immunocompromised subjects, is still an area that is not fully explored and we're looking forward getting more data in, having, in order to have a good understanding on what is the level of protection that can be reached with the vaccine in these different population and to better inform what kind of strategies can be put in place. Next slide. So as we have been saying, uh, it's very clear what would be the immediate benefit for people in terms of uh, 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 vaccine coverage. And uh, of course, protection from symptomatic disease is what we have seen uh, systematically in clinical trials and would be the obvious benefit of uh, all these vaccines. And of course, uh, if fewer people are getting sick, so uh, uh, they will not develop symptom of COVID-19, particularly among high-risk individuals and uh, the elderly, which are quite badly affected by the pandemic, this will, of course, uh, would alleviate the huge burden of disease associated with COVID-19 and the healthcare system and will decrease the mortality, which, let me say, even today, when we see around 3,000 deaths a day across the European Union, this is really unacceptable. And it's very important that we move on rapidly in vaccinating those that are at risk. The preliminary data that are coming from real world evidence from Israel are also showing that these vaccines have the ability not only to protect from the burden of disease associated with COVID, but also to reduce the spread of the virus. So we need more data to confirm this, but I think this is a very important factor. And again, 
another signal of the value of the vaccine in containing and putting an end to this pandemic. So it's, let me say that overall vaccination is crucial in order to beat the pandemic. However, we should not forget that before there is an eye coverage and there is a massive reduction in the spread of the virus around us, it will be very important that we maintain some of the social distancing measuring measures that are in place and we continue to use face masks at least until we get to a point where the majority of people have been vaccinated to a level that really we can really contain the spread of the virus and the deadly consequences that it brings. Next slide. Just to give you a bit of an overview of what we are doing right now, so far we have been interacting with 54 developers of vaccine. Uh, and 30 of these vaccine companies have been interacting with the uh, EMA COVID task force. 42 rapid scientific advice uh, have been delivered for vaccines for COVID-19. As mentioned before, a guidance for developers on how to develop a new vaccine that would tackle the variant has been rapidly issued and agreed also with international regulators. And discussion is ongoing also with respect to what to do for second generation vaccines. So vaccines that have not yet been approved and may have difficulties in running the same type of clinical trials that we've seen so far happening. The importance of post authorization studies for both effectiveness and safety uh, cannot be uh, you know, understated, is extremely important. And again, Peter Allen will talk to you more about this. And as said, the international collaboration with uh, WHO and other regulators worldwide has been really beneficial and really important in the context of, the, of this pandemic in order to fine tune our perspective and making sure that there is global alignment with respect to requirements. Next slide. So let me conclude by uh, stating that indeed all approved vaccines in the EU have shown excellent level of protection against COVID-19 disease, that we have preliminary real-world data that are suggesting that the vaccine are really good in preventing uh, severe disease hospitalization, but also to reduce transmission and to reduce infection. And we need confirmation for that, but this is a very important finding. Most side effects are mild to moderate in severity, and they go away within a matter of few days. All these vaccines have been approved according to the conditional marketing authorization process and scheme, which means that companies will have to provide more evidence after approval. And we are looking forward to reviewing all the additional data that are already coming in and we are looking into in order to convert one day this conditional marketing authorization to full marketing authorization. As said, variant strain of the SARS-CoV-2 are emerging. And in order to be proactive, we already define how we could approve updated version of the vaccines that we already have. Regulators and developers are working together in order to ensure that all these necessarily update can be made rapidly and efficiently so that we will always have vaccines that are effective. And last, vaccination remains critical to control the pandemic. We will play a role and it's very important that vaccination campaigns go on as swiftly as possible in the European Union and around all the world. Thank you very much. And I will now hand over to my colleague Peter Arlett. Thanks very much indeed. And it's my um, uh, task to present to you on the COVID-19 vaccine safety monitoring um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, I'm in the next 10 minutes or so, I will explain why we need uh, monitoring of vaccine safety. I will explain uh, the UTRA vigilance database of suspected adverse uh, drug reaction reports, how regulators look at the reports, um, what we do if we think there may be new or changing risks for a vaccine, where you can find more information, what studies regulators are undertaking on the safety of the vaccines and a word on international collaboration. Go to the next slide, please. 
So the question is, uh, safety monitoring of vaccines, why do we do it? Why do we need to monitor safety after approval? Well, all medicines, including vaccines, have benefits and risks. And at the time of approval, evidence comes mainly from controlled randomized clinical trials in the context of these uh, COVID-19 vaccines, very large clinical trials. After approval, medicines will be used in real conditions in a far larger population. And safety monitoring after approval is important to identify any new or changing risks as quickly as possible, and therefore to be able to take action. Due to the very large numbers of people vaccinated in a short time, we need to ensure that safety monitoring reacts really quickly. And additional resources have been put in place to ensure that our safety monitoring is robust and is rapid so that we can assess new information. Next slide, please. This slide gives a, a visual representation of how safety assurance and safety monitoring is conducted throughout the life cycle of a medicine. And you'll see the blue columns representing the different stages in drug development, pharmaceutical quality, non-clinical, clinical trials, the evaluation and decision, so the marketing authorization evaluation, the manufacturing, and then the post-marketing phase. The pink bars then represent different uh, types of, of safety monitoring that occur during those different phases. Maybe just to mention that uh, the, the foundation of safety is ensuring that you have a product of high quality, and that obviously tests demonstrating that occur during drug development, but also with each batch of vaccine released. There are toxicity studies, including uh, non-clinical and animal studies. Then, then the UDRA vigilance database, the database of suspected adverse drug reaction reports at a European level, starts collecting data even from the clinical trials. Clinical trials themselves may be extended uh, and particularly safety studies done in the, in the uh, on-market phase. And then if we look collectively at other sources of information, we exchange information with international regulators, we uh, um, take um, publications from the, the medical literature. There are specific safety studies that the pharmaceutical companies are conducting, as well as studies conducted by the regulators and academia. And critically, we have reports of, from patients and healthcare professionals, reports of suspected uh, side effects after vaccination. So let's go to the next slide and see how this works. Firstly, let's ask ourselves who's involved in safety monitoring. And you can see from the graphic on the left-hand side of this slide, that it's really a collective effort with many different actors involved. Let's start at the top with the with patients and consumers um, in the context of vaccination. Consumers is probably the, the better term. Um, clearly a very important role in terms of reporting suspected side effects. If we move to healthcare professionals, a, an important role in terms of following the prescribing information um, to give the vaccine safely and effectively, and then taking part perhaps in studies, but also again, reporting suspected side effects national healthcare systems to make sure that um, the uh, systems are in place to collect information, marketing authorization holders, or, or otherwise known as manufacturers of the vaccines, who have, have in very important obligations laid down in law for monitoring the safety of their products and passing on any reports of suspected side effects. And finally, regulatory agencies, including the European Medicines Agency and all the national competent authorities in the different member states, who by law have very explicit uh, and clear responsibilities for monitoring the safety of all medicines, including vaccines. If we look at that collectively, we can say that the EU has a comprehensive safety monitoring and risk management system in place, and we refer to this as the EU pharmacovigilance system. Let's go to the next slide. So how does the safety monitoring continue after approval? Maybe it's best to start on the right-hand side of the slide, and talk about a risk management plan. So a risk management plan is something that is developed and agreed at the time of authorization. It's specifically de developed for each approved vaccine and contains important information about the vaccine's safety, how to collect further information, and how to minimize any risks. It's continually updated as more information becomes available and it's legally binding on the vaccine manufacturer. So if it says that a study needs to be done on safety, then that's legally binding on the manufacturer and the manufacturer has to conduct this study and report on the results. So that's really important. At the time of authorization, we have a plan, a plan for safety that is tailored to each and every vaccine that goes on the market. 
So now, once a product is on the market, we need to detect or to, to monitor to see if there are any new or changing side effects. And this monitoring includes intensive analysis of reports of suspected side effects from patients and healthcare professionals, post authorization safety studies conducted by the manufacturer as well as by the regulators, and additional studies performed in Europe on the safety of vaccines when used in real life. And finally, and as mentioned previously, are benefiting from international collaboration, sharing information with our partners around the world. Next slide, please. Let's focus in on reports of, of, of from patients and healthcare professionals and ask ourselves about the uh, European database of suspected adverse reactions to medicines, user vigilance. Firstly, note the link, the uh, URL link in the top left hand corner of the slide. ADRreports.eu. If you want to find out more about eutrovigilance, that's the link to go to. It also presents anonymized data that has come in through that reporting system. Um, so if you're interested to look at uh, different types of case report, that's the URL link to go to. So what is eutrovigilance showing us? Well, if we look at reports from patients and healthcare professionals up to the 22nd of March, so a couple of days ago, a total of approximately 220,000 worldwide, I emphasize worldwide cases of suspected side effects have been received by eutrovigilance following administration with the three vaccines in use in Europe. So the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine. Let's go to the next slide. If we then look on the right hand side here and, and ask ourselves the question, who has reported? And again, these are worldwide data, not just European data. You can see that there's approximately a 50-50 split between healthcare professionals and non-healthcare professionals. And by non-healthcare professionals, you can read mainly patients. Now that's really interesting because if you look across all medicines in the Eutrovigilance database, you would find a far higher proportion of reports coming from healthcare professionals. In other words, a lower proportion coming from patients. And this is to be expected because these vaccines are being used in healthy people all over Europe. And therefore you would expect the consumers, if you like, um, patients and consumers to be reporting suspected side effects, hence the higher proportion overall. Just to emphasize, and this is a really important message from my presentation, that anyone, anyone can report a suspected side effect, either to their national uh, competent authority, their national medicines authority, or to the vaccine manufacturer. The link in the middle bullet point gives a whole listing of the national authorities so people can find the authority for them. And all reports having been received by a national authority or a pharmaceutical uh, company will be then sent on by law, all of them, to the Eutrovigilance um, database, the European database of suspected side effects. Let's go to the next slide. This slide shows the most commonly reported side effects into the Eutrovigilance database for these uh, COVID-19 vaccines. And the size of the box represents is 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 proportionate to the um, number of reports that we've received and you can see that uh, we have received most headache followed by fever muscle pain chills nausea fatigue joint pain generally feeling unwell injection site pain and dizziness these common report commonly reported side effects are already known they're all listed in the summary of product characteristics because they were all seen in clinical trials. Next slide, please. The point of this slide is to put the reports of suspected side effects into the context of the use of the vaccines. And if we, uh, and so here we have numbers of suspected side effects um, and um, the usage, and these are European data, so European Economic Area data, EU plus Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein. And the sources are given in the bottom right hand corner. So the vaccines administered are taken from the ECDC uh, data and you can find those on the ECDC website and the suspected side effects you can uh, see from the ADR reports website, which is run by EMA. So let's start on the left hand side then with Cominati, the Pfizer vaccine. It was authorized on the 21st of December. Approximately 42 million um, EU citizens or EA citizens have received uh, at least one dose and we've received 94,000 uh, reports of suspected side effects. If we then go to Moderna, authorised on the 6th of January, um, only 2.6 million Europeans have received a dose 
and 4,550 reports of suspected adverse drug reactions as of the 22nd of March. And then finally, AstraZeneca authorized on the 29th of January, 9.2 million European citizens um, uh, have received at least one dose, 28,041 suspected side effects. Let's go and have a, a, a bit more of a detailed look. Let's go to the next slide. So firstly, let's ask ourselves, how do we look at these reports? And particularly, how do we know if a suspected side effect is due to the vaccine? So the EU regulator authorities carefully review all reports to determine if there's any possible link to the vaccine. But it's important to remember that since millions of people will be getting the vaccine in a short time, as shown on the last slide, many of them will develop illnesses for other reasons in close proximity to vaccination. If these occurred very soon after vaccination, then they may well be reported as suspected reactions to the vaccine, when the association actually was just due to chance. Of course, if, an analysis, if the analysis concludes that a new side effect is caused by a vaccine, then we will take action and we will include it in the package leaflet. And I'll go on to talk in a subsequent slide about other actions we might take. Let's go to the next slide. So we talked about trying to differentiate things, events, adverse events happening by chance from potential side effects. How do we do this? Well, we have established analysis techniques in place to assess whether a side effect is caused is likely to be caused by the vaccine. Firstly, and critically, there's intensive clinical review of cases reported by uh, consumers and healthcare professionals to ascertain a possible link with the vaccines. So how quickly after the vaccination did it occur? Are there any clinical features that are common to a series of cases, for example? We then use statistical methods uh, to identify outliers or patterns of reported side effects in our database. And then we try and compare to uh, data from everyday medical practice, so-called real-world data, to ascertain whether the suspected side effect, uh, in, for example, one in close proximity to vaccination, was just due to chance. And here we do something called observed versus expected analysis, where we can calculate from the real-world data how many cases we would expect to see in the background population compared to how many we have seen um, following vaccination. And together, uh, these are some of the key methods we use to establish and analyze. Next slide, please. Let's look at this in a slightly different way. Uh, and let's take the assumption that we have a suspected side effect reported after administration of a vaccine. So I'm starting now at the top of the circle and we're gonna go around clockwise. So if we have a suspected side effect, an issue to be anal analyzed, there's a scientific assessment that looks at the suspected side effects in the context of the person's individual case to determine if it may have been caused by the vaccine or occur for other reasons. The side effects, if we then go to, to the bottom, the side effects are assessed in the context of all available data on the vaccine. So we'll look at the clinical trials data, we'll look at other studies, we'll look at the scientific literature. And then we will reach a conclusion on that particular side effect and put it into the wider context of the overall benefits and risks of the vaccine. So let's assume that the conclusion is that the benefits continue to outweigh the risks but that there is a new or changing say, uh, risk. This could lead to a restriction in the use of the vaccine, a contraindication, or warnings, for example, of to screen or to do tests by the healthcare professional prior to vaccination. Just a few examples of what we might do. If the conclusion is that the risks outweigh the benefit, then the vaccine will be removed from the market. Let's go to the next slide. Now let's go in the, in the next three slides, one by one through the three vaccines that are being used on the European market at the moment. Let's start with Comanati, so the BioNTech-Pfizer vaccine, and these data are as of the 22nd of March, uh, from, and they relate to the European economic area. So as mentioned before, 42 million vaccinated, 94,000 suspected side effects. The identified risks, the risks that are already labeled, include severe allergic reactions, including anaphylaxis, facial paralysis or palsy, fever, headache, muscle pain, injection site swelling, and vomiting and diarrhea are in the process of being added to the product information at the moment. Under assessment by the Pharma Commission's Risk Assessment Committee, so the EMA Committee on Safety, is immune thrombocytopenia, thrombotic events, and localized swelling in persons with a history of dermal filler injections. Go to the next slide. These are the data for the Moderna vaccine. Again, data lock of 22nd of March. European economic area, identified risks are very similar. 
severe allergic reactions, including anaphylaxis, facial paralysis or palsy, fever, headache, muscle, joint pain, injection site swelling, nausea, vomiting, and facial swelling in patients with a history of dermal fillers. And under PRAC, so Pharmacovision's Risk Assessment Committee, <coughs> immune thrombocytopenia and thrombotic events. Go to the next slide. These are the data for the AstraZeneca vaccine. Again, 22nd of March data log, European Economic Area, 9.2 million vaccines administered in the EA, 28,000 suspected side effects, identified risks, again, similar. Severe allergic reactions, including anaphylaxis, headache, fever, muscle and joint pain, injection site swelling, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, and under assessment, immune thrombocytopenia and thrombotic events. Let's go to the next slide. Let's talk now about those thrombotic events, because um, I think most people on this webinar will be aware that there was a very important safety review by the Pharmacovision's Risk Assessment Committee, uh, where interim conclusions were reached last Thursday. So the PRAC concluded its preliminary review of cases of blood clots with the AstraZeneca vaccine and confirmed that the vaccine is not associated with an increase in the overall risk of blood clots and that the benefits in combating the still widespread threat of COVID-19 continue to outweigh the risks of side effects. PRAC recommended including information and advice for healthcare professionals and the public in the vaccine's product information and the amended product information is available on the EMA website on very rare cases of thrombosis associated with thrombocytopenia, so blood clots associated with low platelets. PRAC is continuing its assessment into the reported cases. We have convened an ad hoc expert group, which will meet on the 29th of March to provide additional input. And this includes several specialists, as well as two representatives of the general public. The outcome of that expert meeting, together with further analysis of reported cases, will be fed into PRAC's ongoing evaluation, and we foresee the potential for an updated recommendation from PRAC at its April plenary meeting, which uh, takes place from the 6th to the 9th of, March, of, of April. Go to the next slide. Very briefly, if you want to find more information about the safety of each of the COVID-19 vaccines, then links are provided on the slide. And if you look at the screenshot from the EMA website, it, it orientates you as to where to go and to click. Um, you can find a medicines overview addressing questions and answers in lay language, um, which is available in all EU languages, importantly. Uh, risk management plan can also be scrutinized and recommendations and precautions to be followed for healthcare professionals are in the, health, in the summary of product characteristics and for patients in the patient leaflet. Um, again, available in all EU languages on the EMA website. Let's go to the next slide. So very briefly, um, there are additional safety studies going on at European level um, and the EMA and the national competence authorities are collaborating with academia to make this happen. So firstly, at the end of last year, we put in place an, something we refer to as the early safety monitoring study. This is in people prioritized for vaccination. Um, it collects data through web-based applications currently in eight countries and will run right through 2021 collecting data on safety. In addition, we are expanding on that to start collecting data, not just from more patients in more member states, but also drilling down into special populations, including pregnant women. And we're also putting in place specific studies um, for uh, special populations. Again, I mentioned pregnant women, um, and we have the potential to do dedicated studies to look at specific uh, areas of concern if safety signals arise. Go to the next slide. This last slide just highlights the international collaboration, which is very extensive uh, and very important to our safety monitoring. We have established an international pharmacovigilance network under the auspices of the International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authorities, ICMRA, where there is sharing of experience and communication on vaccines, both pharmacovigilance activities, but also emerging issues. We also have international collaboration with uh, international partners, again, under the auspices of ICMRA on pregnancy research, and we are building international uh, cohorts, including an important study on the um, disease epidemiology of thrombosis, which occurs in COVID-19 uh, uh, disease. Go to the last slide. These are my conclusions. Vaccination is important to prevent people getting sick with COVID-19 disease. 
vaccination will save lives. Fewer people are expected to go to hospital, reducing the burden on the healthcare system and freeing up resources uh, to treat other illnesses. A strong EU farm efficient system is in place and safety is our priority. Unprecedented steps are being taken to monitor safety in practice, to be transparent and to be able to take action immediately. And I think we would like to conclude by saying COVID-19 vaccine safety is stronger with everybody's participation. And our take home message is if you see uh, or, or experience a potential side effect, then please report it. Thank you very much indeed. And it's my pleasure to hand over to Eduardo Colzani, who is Principal Act, uh, Expert Vaccine Preventable Diseases from the ECDC. Eduardo, over to you, please. Thank you very much. So in this talk, uh, I'm going to uh, discuss uh, the expected impact of COVID-19 vaccination in the European Union. So we will move from the perspective of the individual a little bit more to the perspective of the population. Next slide, please. As you see from the outline, we will start from uh, going through what ECDC is currently doing and planning to do in order to assess the impact of vaccination against COVID-19, and then to move and discuss a little bit what are the goals and the strategies of vaccination against COVID-19? This is a discussion that is quite important to have because sometimes in uh, the whole discussion, which can be quite, uh, quite uh, important, but uh, touch upon different aspects, you may lose uh, sight on what is the current objective or the next objective of the vaccination strategy. So it's very important to frame the questions right and also to look at what is the right approach. Then we will touch upon a little bit on the prioritization of target groups for vaccination and some reflections on what are the potential optimal vaccination strategies. And finally, I will just briefly go through what are the other activities for monitoring the impact of vaccination against COVID-19 that we are currently doing. Next slide, please. In the autumn 2020, the European Commission made uh, a call for uh, more coordinated action in uh, the area of COVID-19 vaccination, and in particular, it asked ECDC and EMA some specific tasks. ECDC was in particular asked to support the member states in uh, setting up their own vaccination strategies uh, through the discussion with the technical advisory groups at the national level and also to monitor the vaccine deployment plans and the rollout of the vaccines. There was also this request that ECDC and EMA should jointly work on a monitoring framework to estimate vaccination impact, effectiveness, and promptly detect and analyze safety signals. In this presentation, I will look in particular at the estimation of the vaccination impact and also partly touching upon on the effectiveness. Next slide, please. So at the moment, there are three lines of work that we are looking on, which is the plans and the strategies that we have been monitoring and we have been summarizing in uh, previous documents that have been published. And then the second line of work is the deployment per se, where, as I said, we are monitoring the rollout of the vaccines. We have a vaccine tracker that was mentioned by one of the previous speakers that is providing live information about the doses that are currently administered in the different member states. And also, the, we are also performing some stress tests with the, with the member states to check what are the challenges that they're encountering during their rollout in order to see what could be done slightly different or where the issues may be. And then finally, the third line of work where I'm most involved at the moment is the impact estimation, which is basically looking at what could be the impact of the vaccination at the population level, in particular, uh, through mathematical modeling of scenarios, in particular integrated scenarios of vaccination and non-pharmaceutical interventions. It's important to stress that uh, vaccination is one component, probably the major component of our response to COVID-19 at the moment, but it should not be seen separately and in isolation from the other measures that have been successfully implemented so far. 
and they, they cost a lot in terms, of course, of uh, economy in some way and also at the social and individual level in terms of fatigue. But unfortunately, we are not yet at the point where we can see that we have a vaccination able to remove the necessity of interventions, maybe in the future to lighten some of them. And finally, what we are starting as I speak is the vaccine effectiveness studies in multiple settings, basically using real life data in multiple settings from different uh, member states and start to monitor the vaccine effectiveness on the field. Next slide, please. So starting from the goals, which is always to be recommended and suggested, it's fundamental to define them very well, very clearly. These are just four potential examples, but they don't mean to be prescriptive or you know, the goals that everyone should be looking at. But it is really important to stress the concept that uh, the goals needs to be well-defined, needs to be prioritized, and then the strategy needs to be built around the goals that you have uh, selected. This is very important because uh, in a very dynamic and partly chaotic situation caused by the pandemic, to keep composure and structure with a good strategy, of course, if the strategy is bad and the goal is not good, uh, you will not get what you want. But if you have a good identification of the goal and a good strategy, then keeping uh, and uh, sticking to the plan is really commendable in order to be as efficient and effective as possible. The four goals mentioned here as the protection of vulnerable groups and healthcare system, which can be seen in a way if we want to see these goals as sequential as a first step. We know that uh, this crisis caused by COVID-19 started off by uh, unfortunately causing the death of, of a big number of people uh, in a short period of time, together with uh, overwhelming healthcare capacity and hospital capacity in some settings. So the first step would be to get out of this situation and uh, really you know, in, uh, assure that we don't get again into that type of situation. Then the second goal, could be the reduction of overall mortality and morbidity from COVID-19 in the whole population, which is, if you want, uh, uh, broadening a little bit the scope of the first goal that I mentioned. A third potential goal is what have been quite extensively discussed also in the media about reopening societies. This is a, an urgent and important need, but we need to put it in perspective of the previous two goals that I mentioned, because uh, as I said from the beginning, it's important to have a structure and have clear in mind all the steps that need to be done, because if we try to achieve everything in parallel, especially in a situation where the supply of the vaccine is not yet as high as we would like, we may risk to be less effective and less efficient and waste some time. And finally, it's a final goal that is more of a wish at this stage rather than a real achievable goal at the moment is disease elimination. There are some countries that are almost reached disease elimination without vaccination by basically isolating and uh, testing and tracing quite aggressively. In the context of the European continent, this may not be so easy even in the presence of a very good vaccination coverage, because as we see, we have a virus that mutates, we have the variant, uh, the variant sorry, and we also have possible uh, decreased uptake in some of the target groups. So it is, uh, let's say, uh, uh, an appealing goal, but maybe it's not so sustainable and it's not so easy to reach and it may come with a big cost, in particular if the vaccination do not provide a long duration of protection. As I put here in this slide, there are also other factors that can contribute to change the scenario where we are. There are issues related with vaccine supply, issues related with logistics, issues related with the characteristic of the existing vaccines that we discover, as it was mentioned by previous speakers, as vaccines are rolled out, we learn more about their effectiveness against transmission, their uh, effectiveness in some specific risk groups and uh, against the severe disease and hospitalization. 
all of these aspects are relevant and may affect which strategy and how we want to reach the goals, including aspects related to safety, of course. And finally, as I said, the mutation, the virus changes and affects the disease characteristics and also the protection from the existing vaccines. So all of these may require a little bit of adaptation and uh, some flexibility in the way we approach our objectives. Next slide, please. Again, here, once the goals are set and prioritized, then it's a matter of identifying the right strategy by targeting the groups that we need to target in order to get where we want. But in particular, I will stress it's important that strategies are driven by evidence, by the data, and they keep monitoring this data if they really mirror what we expect to see. And that, as I said, they need also to be partly adaptable to a very dynamic panorama and a changing scenario in case of uh, uh, changes that are unforeseen or, or uh, quite uh, occurring quite unexpectedly. Next slide, please. Then there is uh, the importance of uh, having criteria for prioritization of target groups. Target groups have been identified, of course, already by most uh, or all the member states at this stage. But it's important to consider this as an iterative process where we need, according to our objective and strategy all the time, think again how we want to prioritize and target the different groups for vaccination, including other aspects, as I said, related to variants, uh, characteristic of the vaccine and uptake in some specific groups. One principle is the individual protection principle, which is probably the main one. So those individuals that are at increased risk of developing severe disease are, of course, the ones that should be looked at first as a strong candidates for vaccination but also the ones that are exposed to the virus due to their societal role or their professional role, they could also be exposed like some healthcare workers to high viral load and therefore risk severe disease because of that. Then it's important to consider in a pandemic the societal role of the individuals, the essential workers, the frontline workers, especially in the most uh, uh, acute phases of the pandemic, they need to be protected in order to maintain the society functional and to be able to provide to all the citizens the basic services that are needed. Then there is the issue of the indirect protection. This is something that we consider very important, in particular, if the, there is a, a possibility that the vaccine is able to protect against uh, transmission. We are already seeing some positive signs in this direction, but as it was discussed before, this is yet not conclusive evidence. Nevertheless, it is good to know that there is some potential effect also on the surroundings of the vaccinated people, in particular of those that are in contact with vulnerable and fragile individuals, and also those that are in contact with individuals who cannot be vaccinated. And finally, there is uh, another, uh, another criterion that was raised by WHO in one of its documents, that is reciprocity, and in this case may refer in particular to those workers, for instance, healthcare workers that had to pay a heavy toll during the first waves of the pandemic. And so their prioritization would also be seen as a recognition of their key role and sacrifice on top of the other criteria that I've just mentioned. Next slide, please. Now, we published in December a report where we wanted to look at uh, the uh, different strategies and see what would be the impact of uh, addressing and targeting the vaccination to different groups. This is quite, uh, I will try to make it as simple as possible because uh, it is quite uh, uh, a busy slide. But if you look at panel A at the left upper hand corner, you will see that we make a comparison between vaccinating all the age groups and vaccinating uh, all adults in the population. And as you see here, by vaccinating people over the age of 60, which is the orange bar, you would theoretically avert up to 90% of the deaths that you would avert by vaccinating all adults. This is a strong argument in favor of vaccinating all the age groups that are the ones that are most suffering from hospitalization and deaths due to COVID-19. And as you see here, we quantify that to be very high. 
However, this was done under the assumption that the vaccine would not have uh, some indirect protection, some uh, effect on transmission. If you just move slightly to the right on the same panel A, you see the same type of graph while assuming some moderate effect on transmission. You see that then the relative importance of vaccinating older adults decreases a little bit, but still stays around 70% of averted death compared to vaccinating all the population, the adult population, which is still a lot. And it's again, a strong argument to addressing first this group, if your objective is to reduce deaths. Next slide, please. Then what if we include on top of older adults, younger people with preconditions. What is the marginal benefit? What do we gain on top of it? Well, if you look now at panel C, this is what we call efficiency because it's basically saying that by giving one single dose of vaccine, how many deaths you would avert compared to giving one dose of vaccine to uh, any adult over the age of 18. As you see here in the blue bar, giving uh, the single dose of vaccine or a set dose of vaccine to a person 80 or 70, it can provide in terms of efficiency, really the protection, the prevention of uh, as many as uh, six or four deaths compared to vaccinating someone from the overall population. And it is quite as double as vaccinating and including vaccination of younger people with precondition. Again, this is not saying that vaccinating people, younger people with precondition is not important. It is very important. But here we took the perspective of maximizing the efficiency at the population level when you introduce the vaccination. So this is once again, another consideration that goes in favor of an age staggered approach starting from older individuals and then moving downwards and then given supply you can then decide to expand in parallel to risk groups in younger age uh, age groups of the population next slide please and this is looking again in similar way but at the vaccination of healthcare workers and uh, if you see the panel c you will see that if a vaccine as we are seeing is having an effect on transmission, then the impact of vaccinating healthcare workers at the population level may become very, very efficient because these people are strong contact with uh, sick individuals or people at risk of getting severe COVID. Therefore, the indirect protection provided by vaccinating healthcare workers would have very many positive externalities also for the people that they are in touch with. So that we, it will have an important effect at the population level and therefore it will be quite efficient as well. Next slide, please. So how to maximize then the impact of COVID-19 vaccination on society? Well, there is not a single answer. The choice of an optimal strategy depends on the objective, as we said, and I will not uh, dwell into that again. And the prioritization of COVID-19 vaccination should take into account several dimensions and should always need to be contextualized. Also, the optimal strategy depends on the characteristics of the vaccine. As we said, if the vaccine in particular is effective against transmission and therefore confers indirect protection. But if our objective, our initial objective is to reduce deaths and hospitalization from COVID-19, then the prioritization of those groups at higher risk of severe disease, and as we say, as we saw, possibly using an ACE staggered approach is probably the most effective and efficient way to reach this objective. Next slide, please. So just to conclude on this, the societal benefit is heightened if the vaccines are effective against disease transmission because it provides indirect protection and vaccinating of adults uh, age 18 to 59 or 18 to 55, it's not important the cutoff here, it's important the concept, the younger adults, is probably not the most effective and efficient strategy to reduce COVID-19 deaths, especially in a situation where supply is limited. However, consideration could be given to specific groups or settings that may have a disproportionate risk of exposure or to individuals at high risk of severe disease. 
Next slide, please. One of my final uh, messages here is coming from another document we published uh, uh, in February this year and was highlighting a very simple but very important concept that we are not yet at all at the stage where we can lift the non-pharmaceutical intervention. We cannot lift the other measures that are in place and that they are, of course, something that we are all tired of to some extent but uh, it is not possible to do that because uh, the vaccination has not reached yet to cover a good enough proportion in particular of uh, people at risk of severe disease, but more in general, the population level, so that we can comfortably lift or lighten some of these measures without paying the consequences in terms of deaths and hospitalization. And also any delay on the vaccination deployment will, of course, delay the time when it will be possible to consider lightening some of these measures. Next slide, please. This is just a brief uh, screenshot of the vaccine tracker that I was mentioning. Just to mention the other activities that we are doing, this is about monitoring how the vaccines are being rolled out in the European Union in all the countries. And if you want, you can play with this tool that is rather nice, was made by some of my colleagues, and it's giving you a live idea of where we are with the deployment. Next slide, please. And then I will conclude with uh, the upcoming activity, which is the post-marketing authorization vaccine effectiveness and impact studies. And uh, we, we are planning to do uh, quite a number of these studies in different things in order to monitor vaccine effectiveness and also to collaborate with EMA in uh, doing this specific monitoring and activity, which is extremely important, not only for the short run, but also to look into the future because the virus will continue to mutate. So we will need to make sure that all the settings, all the age groups, their situations are not changing according to what we expect. And of course, it's important to do real world vaccine effectiveness because, as it was mentioned in previous presentation, not everything is uh, can be assessed during trials and at the authorization, the conditional authorization moment. So there are other questions that uh, still need to be uh, defined a little bit better and answered a little bit better with uh, more uh, big, bigger numbers and more data that may come. And uh, next slide, please. With this one, I thank you for uh, for your attention. I want to thank also my colleagues that supported throughout these activities. And now I will need, leave the floor to Dr. Melanie Carr, who is Head of Stakeholders and Communication Division at EMA. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eduardo, and good afternoon to everyone. I'd like to update you on EMA's approach to transparency and communication. On to the next slide, please. So this provides an outline of what I'm going to cover. I'll highlight some of the information we're publishing, how we're communicating, and then talk a little bit about who we're collaborating with. I'm very conscious of the time, so I'm gonna walk you as rapidly as I can through, through the slide deck. On to the next slide, please. So at EMA, extraordinary measures have been put in place to enhance the level of transparency on COVID-19 medicines. And as we surpass the one year mark since COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic, I'd really like to acknowledge the work of the team at EMA and our colleagues across the network in implementing those transparency measures. Why is it important? Well, we know there's a huge amount of information circling, circulating out there, but not, of all, not all of it's clear and not all of it's accurate. So access to valid information on vaccines from trusted sources such as the EMA is more important than ever. At EMA, we don't just want to publish information, but really to try and communicate better. So to add context to the data released and explain the science in plain language. Access to data is key to reinforcing trust clearly, um, and also about helping the public to understand the, the rationale underpinning those important decisions on vaccines. Engagement also remains crucial. We're actively listening to questions and to any concerns, so hopefully we can address them. And we're also avidly involving stakeholders and members of the public in our activities. On to the next slide, please. So 
So what information is being published? Well, we're providing information really throughout a vaccine's life cycle. And on this slide, I provide some of the sorts of information we're publishing, and I'll come on to share a few examples. So during development, we provide information on those medicines that have received EMA advice. We're also very transparent about the topics discussed by our scientific committees, and we regularly publish meeting minutes and agendas. We also will announce publicly when we commence a rolling review or start the evaluation of an application for marketing authorization, and that is to let people know what is coming through the regulatory approval process. At the stage of the marketing authorization, we'll also publish the outcome of the assessment, whether that be a recommendation for approval or even if it's a negative outcome or a withdrawal. At that point of the approval, we'll, we'll publish product information in all European languages, together with an overview which provides information about the vaccine and why it's been approved in simple language. We'll also rapidly publish the European Public Assessment Report, and that provides more comprehensive information about EMA's assessment and explains why we've taken the decisions that we have. We also provide more information about the safety profile, as Peter Arlott highlighted, in the form of the risk management plan. And thereafter, we'll publish the clinical data that's been submitted to EMA in those applications for COVID-19 medicines as, as the authorization has been made. And we've then gone on to remove any personal data or any commercially confidential information. And then finally, post-authorization, we'll update on any important changes and also publish regular safety updates at monthly intervals. On to the next slide, please. So this is an example of an image we regularly publish to update the regulatory status of vaccines. So here on the left-hand side, you see those three vaccines that are currently under rolling review. In the middle is where we report any pending applications for marketing authorization. Currently, there are none pending. And on the right-hand side, those four authorized vaccines that we've already heard about. And that image is updated each week. And if you'd like to follow it, you can do, do so on EMA's Twitter channel. On to the next slide, please. So if you're looking for more information on individual vaccines, as I mentioned, you can start high level with the product information, then you can dive into the medicines overview for more detail. Then on the assessment, you can look into the European Public Assessment Report. And if you'd like to drill down further into the clinical data, this is where you would go. This is our website where we publish the clinical data. And already you'll find there that we've published the data on the Moderna vaccine and the Comirnaty. It includes the clinical summaries, the clinical overviews, and the actual clinical study reports that have been provided in the application for marketing authorization. On to the next slide, please. If you're interested in more information about the safety profile, we're publishing regular, mo regular monthly safety updates on any emerging safety data for each authorized vaccine as well as any, any updates on assessments carried out by EMA um, and the scientific committee, the, the safety committee, the CRAC. There's additional background information on the vaccine, as well as information on any planned or ongoing studies and information on how to report any side effects. On to the next one, please. So a few words about how we're communicating. We've developed and published a series of new information materials. We're also responding to queries from members of the public, from patients, health professionals, academics and media. We're updating on key developments in the press, organising public meetings such as this one and engaging on social media, as well as through interviews with, with journalists in the media. We're working closely with ECDC to provide content on the European Vaccination Information Portal, which is also available in all EU languages. And as and when needed, we'll be publishing safety communications to complement the monthly safety updates I referred to. On to the next one, please. So this is just really to share some examples and some links to different information and material for you. So this is the, the material about um, key facts on COVID-19, what we call tier one material. And that addresses many of the frequently asked questions from the general public. On to the next one, please. This is the tier two. This describes the information on how vaccines are developed, evaluated, approved, and monitored on COVID-19 vaccines. And the material here is really aimed both at stakeholders and the general public. So amongst other points, this explains how COVID-19 vaccines are being developed, 
following the same legal requirements for pharmaceutical quality, safety and efficacy as all other medicines. On to the next one, please. And this is tier three. Again, more information here on the types of studies needed to approve a COVID-19 vaccine, including in the area of pharmaceutical quality, manufacturing, for example, non-clinical safety, and on inf information on clinical efficacy and safety as well. On to the next one, please. So who are we engaging with? Well, we're actively engaging with patients and healthcare professionals through the representatives in EMA's pandemic task force, all, also through our regular working party meetings, and also healthcare professionals and patient consumer organisations in academia are helping us user test some of those information materials so we can hopefully make them as understandable as possible. We're also working closely with the European Commission, with the ECDC and the National Competent Authorities, and we are making efforts to communicate information really in the most meaningful way, using plain language um, and hopefully to promote understanding. On to the next one, please. So we're very keen to listen to and address questions and concerns on vaccines that arise and public meetings um, provide an excellent opportunity to engage, such as this one. As well as today's meeting, we've held previous public meetings in December and January. And if you'd like to look back at those, there are links on our website. On to the next one, please. We're also keen then to hear whether these meetings are useful, how we can do better. And this was my final slide. And here I'd like to leave you with a link to our website for further information on all the COVID-19 related material. And there you can also um, shortly find a link where you will be able to report some feedback on this meeting. So we're very keen to hear how we can improve to make these most useful moving forward. I'll leave it there then. Thank you and back to Noel. Thank you very much. Thanks to all the speakers, um, Marco, uh, Peter, Eduardo, and, and Melanie for the valuable um, information given, updates, and new information. Um, we are now going to break. We are running late, unfortunately, so I can only give you, uh, well, let's meet again at uh, 2.37, so five minutes. Um, because we expect by the number of uh, comments, we are extending the Q&A session until quarter past three. Uh, so I hope that is, that is okay for everyone. During the break, you will see one slide where we have enabled a Slido survey through which we would like to hear from you and get your feedback about this public meeting and whether you think it is useful and how we can improve it. So if you have some spare time, please have a look at that and provide us with your feedback. So with that, I will, um, we will break now for five minutes and come back uh, no later than uh, 2.37. So good afternoon and, uh, and welcome back. Uh, we will now open the floor to the various members of the public who have been invited to join us here in the virtual WebEx room. Uh, we have citizens, patients, carers, consumers, healthcare professionals, pharmaceutical industry and academia residing in a wide range of countries, 24 European Union and 18 non-EU countries. We have received a, a large number of requests. Unfortunately, we could not accommodate all these requests. So during the selection process, we endeavor to include a well-balanced group of stakeholders, affiliations, and also geographical locations using a random selection process for fairness. We invite those who have joined us in the WebEx room to write to us in the chat box. And I've already seen quite a number of, of uh, comments which have been raised or to raise their hand to take the microphone. Uh, when speaking, we encourage everyone to turn on their camera so we make it more interactive. Uh, in addition, we have enabled a dedicated mailbox for those who are following the event via the live broadcast so they can also send us comments or questions. In addition to the four speakers that we had just before the break, we are also joined by Fergus Sweeney, who is the head of clinical studies and manufacturing. I now pass on uh, to my colleague, Juan, Juan Garcia Burgos, who is head of 
public and stakeholder engagement who will assist in reading some of the contributions we receive via the chat or through the external mailbox. So, Juan, we're listening. Good. Good afternoon. Thank you, Noel. And good afternoon, everybody. And yes, we'll we'll go through the questions which have been received through the chat. And also we'll alternate with questions we are receiving from the outside for the people who are um, following the broadcast. And also we'll give the floor to the ones who are in the rooms for which uh, they will have to raise their hand and we will be uh, giving. So we can start with some of the questions on the on the chat. And we have a question, for example, from Joseph Drapwell, who is asking, and about what what kind of evidence we have of people being infected the second time, but uh, with a new variant, uh, and whether this there is any kind of protection with the vaccines that we are administering. Um, can I hand over to you, Marco? Yes, certainly. I think it's a very good question, and uh, we are starting seeing some evidence from South Africa, in particular, where, as you know, some trials from some of the vaccines under development were conducted and there they saw that in the placebo arm, so those that did not receive uh, the vaccine and they were seropositive at baseline, they were really, they had a high chance of getting infected again with the new variant. And also from Brazil, we have seen some data reported in the literature that reinfection can happen. So now what we need to do is to really better characterize uh, how frequently this happens and whether it happens uh, if it leads uh, to a severe disease or if only it's a kind of mild disease, which is what we may expect based on our knowledge of human coronaviruses as a whole. But of course, this is a very important question and we need more evidence in order to confirm that. And on top of this, of course, to understand also from a vaccination perspective, uh, what can happen and what are the chances that you get reinfected and in particular what kind of severity the reinfection could could lead to. Thank you, Marco. Juan? We are going to take a question from the and uh, Jalin van de Source from the European Association of Hospital Pharmacists uh, has asked the floor. Please go ahead if you can. Um, I, I have uh, three points actually and uh, it's very informative uh, this session. One of the things I, I wonder is uh, the disease varies between different ethnic groups. Is there also evidence that the effect of the vaccines differ between ethnic groups? That's the first question. And the second question is about the thromboembolic events. What we did see is that different countries had different actions on this, and that caused quite a bit of confusion. Is there a possibility that EMA is uh, playing a more central and uh, role in actually in the actions that should be taken by the countries? And I know that EMA gives advice, but uh, so far the countries have followed up the advice by their own uh, by their own thoughts. So that's the second question. And the third question is for us as healthcare professionals, it's important also to inform our public. And sometimes it's difficult to find the right material. Would it be possible for EMA to provide us as healthcare professionals with sets that can be used for us to inform the public? Well, thank you very much. So for the third question, perhaps Melanie, about uh, healthcare professionals. Thank you for the question. And indeed, we, as we, as I described, we have a range of material which could could potentially be used. So we would be very happy to explore further with yourself and other healthcare professional organisations how we might support rollout of that information um, through healthcare professionals. We'd be very happy to do that. Over. Perhaps that is something that we can explore at the level of the working group with uh, healthcare. Uh, professional organizations and patient organizations and take it up at that level. Then the question about the ethnics, I think it is addressed in the product information for the various products, or perhaps uh, Marco can uh, uh, give some further information. Uh, yeah, indeed, uh, uh, the trials, at least the main clinical trials for most of the vaccines, try to include minorities uh, into uh, subject that uh, were recruited in the trials. Uh, and uh, we have not seen really major deviation. Of course, some, sometimes it's been difficult to have really large group, but so far we don't see anything that would be particularly worrisome in this respect 
but look forward to get more data in terms of effectiveness studies. Thank you. And perhaps for the second question, if I've well understood, I think it's the role of the agency, of course, uh, to do an assessment of any un, uh, of any new information, any any data which uh, which we become aware of, either through the spontaneous reporting, real world evidence, uh, data provided by pharmaceutical companies, and then for the agency to give a conclusion in terms of the benefit and, and risk if they if continues to be positive what then happens at the next level in terms of how member states are using that in the context of their national vaccination programs where they have to take into account a lot of different aspects including what vaccines do they have at their disposal how many doses do they have of them etc that is then a decision for the member states to take on on the basis of the advice the scientific advice and the recommendation which is given by the by the agency uh, back to you, Juan. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to read one of the questions which has been submitted from the outside, but also is in the chat. It's uh, from Isabel Proaño Gomez, uh, who is representing the European Federation of Allergy and Airways Diseases Patients Association. And he's asking about um, allergic reactions due to COVID-19 vaccines. In particular, she would like to know about information on the numbers or how many reactions have been reported and, and whether there has been any death due to anaphylaxis and also whether there is any pattern that causes the reactions or anything has been observed so far. And then finally, whether based on this information, whether there is any data which uh, allows to take any additional measure to protect the patients from these reactions. Thank you. Peter? Thanks very much for the question. So, um, uh, firstly, um, maybe just to focus on the anaphylaxis, it's a very interesting from a safety monitoring point of view. Maybe I can use it just to emphasize a few points. Um, so, um, allergic reactions were seen in the clinical trials but very severe allergic reactions, including anaphylaxis, were only seen uh, in, if you like, the rollout of the vaccines, but they were seen quite quickly. And um, I think it is a mark of the agility, the rapid response of the, of the uh, regulatory system and the farm commission system, that those reports were fed back into the marketing authorization assessment in Europe, the reports coming from the US. So that by the time the Pfizer vaccine was authorized, for example, they were already labeled and we were already able to give advice to reduce risk. Um, I think Marco gave a frequency of, of, of less than one in 100,000 um, individuals vaccinated. Um, there, is, um, there are warnings about patients with a history of allergy in general. And obviously, if somebody has had an allergic reaction to their first dose, they should not have a second dose of that vaccine. Um, in terms of exact breakdowns of, of front by reporter type and severity, I don't have those figures at my fingertip, but I think the summary I've given gives an overview. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Kuvan? Yes, uh, we will uh, read um, a question from the chat internally, and it's a question from Sandy Kiefer, who is asking uh, whether there are studies which um, uh, talks about the fact that the person can transmit the, beer, the virus after being vaccinated and whether they, we have any evidence about that. Marco? Yeah, that's, uh, this is something that, of course, we are looking into, uh, but what we're seeing is that uh, uh, overall it looks like uh, the vaccines are able to prevent symptomatic disease. And as I said, in some cases, at least, it turns out that also can prevent infection which means that uh, at the very least there will be a significant reduction of the viral load, which is the main driver of the possibility of then transmitting the virus. Uh, there has been not really any good studies so far that look into this aspect really in terms of viral load and potential for transmission, but the current evidence will be supportive of the fact that there will be a significant reduction in the possibility that the virus get transmitted even if there is a breakthrough cases. Uh, but of course, uh, we need to gather more evidence and to have more clarity in this respect. Thank you, Marco. Juan? Thank you. We'll, we'd like to give the floor to Francois Ouillet from uh, Eurordis. Thank you very much, um, Juan. My, my first comment is a follow-up to one of the previous questions. I think it was more a call to member states to uh, really use existing procedures. Um, there will be other side effects. 
uh, I think it would help a lot uh, if they could use uh, this urgent safety referrals to have first a European discussion on the uh, effects they, they see so that we have a coordinated action and, and a reaction. Uh, transparency is, is useful and needed, um, but here we don't clearly see to which these uh, benefited at the end of the day. Um, I have a question to Eduardo Colzani from ECDC. I'd like to hear your opinion about the different strategies that member states have adopted. Uh, in your report, 12 to 14 member states started to vaccinate people with comorbidities simultaneously with uh, age groups uh, above 60. Um, and that includes people with rare disease and the highest priority of the rare disease. But others decided to first complete the vaccination of people above 60 and then only to start vaccinating people with comorbidities and, and rare disease. Uh, could you comment if uh, these two approaches could have different outcomes in terms of the models that you that you do? Second point, uh, we take note of the data to come on how to vaccinate young people uh, this year, uh, hopefully. Um, about suspected adverse drug reactions, two simple questions. Uh, when people are reporting on side effects, spontaneous reports, which key, which essential information do you need? Of course, the name of the vaccine, the date, whether it's the first dose, second dose, but do you also expect data on underlying conditions? And which level of precision do you need? Uh, a, the, the large class, like uh, rare coagulation disorders, or the exact name and type of the disease? and uh, also for regarding the name of the vaccines. By May or June, you may receive submissions for second generation vaccines from the same manufacturers. How are we going to name the vaccines the same way? Does it matter to know if it's the second or the first generation, or is there a reflection to facilitate the communication and the use of different names from the same manufacturers, but uh, depending on its uh, uh, whether it's, it's for first generation or new generation against the new variants. Thank you. These were three questions, Francois. <laughs> so we'll try to address the three questions. Um, for the spontaneous reporting and what type of information, I give the floor to Peter, but perhaps let's first start with Eduardo and the question that was asked to ECDC. Eduardo? Yes, thank you. So as I said during the presentation, it is not uh, every every strategy needs to be contextualized. The context is important. So from ECDC perspective, we don't provide a prescriptive approach to how the member states should or should not act. What uh, we try to convey as a message is that they need to have a clear goal in mind and then develop a strategy that takes into account their own context and the situation where they are. Of course, the circulation of the variants may not be the same in all age groups and in all countries. You may also have a different age stratification in the different countries. And you may also have uh, what we think also a practical challenge of identifying a specific people with preconditions and uh, draw a line and be able then to effectively target them. And this may change according to member state or even regions within member states. So it is really difficult to be prescriptive in this sense, but in general, of course, uh, the approach of reducing mortality, as, a, as I wrote in one of the slides, needs to look at uh, uh, prioritizing those who are at a severe risk or uh, at risk of severe disease, which are mainly older adults and people with precondition. The age staggered approach can be seen as a very practical uh, approach where you maximize in a, let's say in a flat way the numbers in a, a rapid way but countries they have their own modeling and they may have seen that they're in their own context it is also making sense to approach the things in parallel so both both ways are valid it's just a matter of contextualized and knowing very well your own situation over thank you eduardo um uh, Francois, the, the point you raised about the, about the processes or the procedures that we use in these uh, in these very challenging times is, of course, something that we are carefully looking into. And in fact, you have five aspects. You have the aspect of the data, and as I said, I will give the floor to to Peter to further elaborate on that. You have the the assessment. You have the decision making, 
you have the transparency and the communication and all that in um, in a very challenging times where of course you would like to to be as transparent as possible to the general public you would like to make sure that you have enough data in order to take your decisions you have to share within the network so that everyone is informed at the same uh, at the same moment in in time otherwise you put other uh, member states in a more difficult situation uh, and we don't like a reactive mode you would all like to be as proactive as as possible that's why uh, following the astrazeneca and the um, uh, cases with uh, rare uh, thromboembolic events that uh, we are already undertaking kind of lessons learned see uh, what we have, have we learned from this particular episode and what can we do in order to further improve so uh, this is something that we are working on um, Peter in terms of the, the amount and the type of of information that we need for the spontaneous reporting to facilitate this decision making over to you Yes, yeah, so thanks very much, uh, Noel, and th thanks, uh, uh, François Ouillet, for the, for the question. So first thing, uh, back to basics, we look at all available evidence, when both when trying to detect safety issues, but also particularly when trying to evaluate them. So that's randomised controlled trials, uh, real-world data, epidemiological data, background events um, of, uh, of, of adverse uh, events of special interest, laboratory data, and of course, and critically, spontaneously reported suspected adverse drug reaction reports, which I think your question focused on. Um, if a patient is or a citizen is reporting a suspected side effect, this the, it is very important not just to have COVID-19 vaccine, but to understand the brand. The technology platforms upon which these vaccines are developed are different. Um, and so although some of the side effects uh, that are known are common, there could be side effects that are specific to vaccines. So it's very important to have the brand and if possible, the batch number. Um, beyond that, the more the better. Um, and um, obviously there's a bit of a burden of reporting, but if it's a report coming from an individual citizen talking about their side effect, then obviously I think they're gonna want to provide as much information as possible. So yes, dates, yes, background uh, um, disease, um, because it, the event might be related to some, some underlying condition. Um, terminology you asked about, very interesting. So clearly, if a patient or a citizen has a specific diagnosis that's been given by a healthcare professional, then that's probably more helpful than just describing symptoms, um, because we have, would have to infer a diagnosis just from symptoms. However, the research on the value of um, patient reports and citizen reports does show that patients and citizens tend to describe symptoms more than give medical diagnoses. They also tend to give less laboratory data, probably because they have less access to it than the healthcare professional. Um, so a kind of headline answer would be to provide as much contextual information and um, information about the, uh, the event as possible, because that will help in the clinical evaluation and the causality assessment of the individual cases. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Huam? Thank you very much. I will read now a question which has been received in the, from the outside. It's from Will Manol and she represents the European Geriatric Medicine Society. And she, she's asking about the efficacy rates which has been reported in all the people in the clinical trials that uh, suggest that might be lower than the 95, uh, 94% we was available for, for the patients. And is asking what, how EMA is addressing this issue. And then she's also ask, asking that there are there are starting to be first cases reported of all the people that uh, are being uh, attended in hospital because of COVID-19 after vaccination and whether there is any initiative which is going to be put forward in order to have a, a EU-wide registration of COVID vaccines after vaccination in line to what uh, Eduardo mentioned before. Marco? Yeah, so the, the clinical trials try to recruit as much as possible elderly individuals, or at least more than what we normally see, which I think was, was a good thing to do. But of course, uh, the number of individuals above 80 years of age was still limited also in these clinical trials. And uh, I think it would not be unexpected to see that somehow uh, protection will be uh, lower in the, in the very old compared to uh, subject below 80 years of age. 
Uh, and that's the reason why we really need these effectiveness studies. And of course, you know, the, the, the very old above 80 years of age are one of the key target groups for obvious reason. And so it's very important to collect this data in a timely manner and to evaluate them to really understand what is the impact of the vaccines on this population, not forgetting that what we are really after in this population is hospitalization and uh, ICU admission and death. So really the hard clinical endpoints is what we are most interested for this population. And we are looking forward uh, examining more of these data as they emerge, and I'm sure there will be more to come. But what we're seeing so far, like also from the data from Scotland, are quite positive in this respect. So we're seeing quite a good level of protection from these hard clinical endpoints in the elderly above 80 years of age. Thank you, Marco. Ron? Yeah, we would now like to give the floor to Elena Protelos from EFA, who is in the room. So, first of all, thank you very much for the very comprehensive presentation and for the whole series of events. Uh, three questions from, um, from UFA. The first one is we saw last year in spring and in the summer direct funding to um, address infrastructural preparedness and monitoring, including for real world data collection um, by the AMA with access and consign and many other projects. And we have also seen the output of access and VAC for EU in February. Um, having looked at the output on the feasibility aspect on the capacity assessments and the fact um, less than half the member states have actually responded, responded um, are the plans to address um, this aspect further? I mean, particularly given the assessment that was rudimentary. And or are the plans to actually communicate either to the Health Security Committee or to the Commission the results uh, on the difficulty of establishing um, a more uh, robust infrastructure for preparedness across member states? On the same topic, uh, are we confident that we have a comprehensive uh, reporting, sp including spontaneous um, from rural and remote areas where we may have digital uh, divides, literacy divides, uh, access issues, language issues? And um, last but not least, is there at the moment either an EMA or an ECDC driven real world evidence collection generation effort for the immunity and related aspects on variants? And has the EMA been asked to provide input regarding the robustness of such data by the Health Security Committee. Um, we also mentioned, or we've seen mentioned the ACDC models um, for um, data collection. Are these capture potential behavioral change post-vaccination, potentially including perceived risk and risk compensation in the case of introducing different measures beyond NPIs? Uh, such as immunity passports or vaccination certificates in the context of cross-border control and uh, without potential definition of what constitutes essential travel across member states. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will reply to the three questions, but can I perhaps ask in order to allow as many people as possible to, to uh, intervene uh, that we limit ourselves to, to one question. Um, so I'll give the floor. My apologies, my apologies. No, it is okay. It is okay. It is okay. We'll try to do our best, but we have a limited time. So, um, so I give the floor to Peter, and then perhaps also to compliment Peter to Eduardo. Thanks very much indeed, and uh, thanks, Elena, for recognizing the importance of uh, the European efforts to stimulate research on the monitoring of the vaccines as well as on the disease epidemiology, which is clearly a very important foundation for understanding vaccine safety. You mentioned the ACCESS um, consortium and the CONSIGN consortium. So the ACCESS consortium was to um, a consortium funded by EMA to create a network and protocols for safety and effective monitoring of the vaccines and kicked off in the middle of last year. Um, and by the end of last year, we had an established network, we had uh, model protocols, and we also started to produce background uh, rates for adverse events of special interest. And those adverse events of special interest have been critical, critical to our safety monitoring because they allow, they provide context to the spontaneously reported suspected reactions. For example, in the safety review that the PRAC con uh, concluded uh, last Thursday, on thrombosis and embolism, the background rates of thrombosis and embolism were available from multiple member states. 
to provide the context um, as to what we would expect from the background population. So, uh, so money very well spent and, an, and a collaboration with academia, which is uh, uh, proving very important for the, this vaccine campaign. Consign is clearly equally important, although on a slightly longer time frame, um, because most pregnancies last nine months, but we'll look at the um, natural history of COVID-19 and pregnant women, pregnancy outcomes, how they're being treated and so on. Um, and obviously these are just, I'm just focusing on the ones you mentioned, but there's really important initiatives from ECDC, from the European Commission funded through RTD, and also from eu for health Maybe just to mention, you mentioned behavioural studies. There are various initiatives funded by the Commission, including, for example, the Orchestra Consortium, which will be looking not just, if you like, at pharmacoepidemiology vaccines and, and therapeutics and, and COVID-19 uh, patients, but we'll also be looking at the wider societal impact of COVID-19. And they'll be really interesting in terms of learning lessons uh, from this pandemic. I think I'll stop there. Thanks, Noah. Thank you. Just to complement uh, to what Peter said very well, uh, at ECDC, we are planning to look at, uh, if I understood correctly, the question, also the variance point from the point of view of looking at uh, breakthrough infections through the studies that we are about to, uh, to start, uh, which is the real world studies on vaccine effectiveness, where we will also monitor the presence of the variants of breakthrough infections and therefore uh, gather more information about how the vaccines may act against this type of, uh, of uh, variants. And then in terms of the modeling, uh, our modeling work, uh, it does not take uh, into account, uh, doesn't assume behavioral changes at the moment following vaccination. But of course, we have discussed internally this aspect and possibly the, the, next, um, the next output may integrate uh, some of that part because it, it may be relevant. And then when it comes to certificates, ECDC is in favor of a medical use of the vaccination certificate, which is the documentation of the doses received by a person also for medical purposes and, uh, and information also in the uh, electronic registries that we are supporting the member states to uh, develop and uh, encouraging them to develop electronic registries where all information about vaccinated individuals is available. Another issue is the vaccine passport and the non-medical use. That is a bit more under discussion. Of course, there is a lot of expectation, but our role is mainly to assess the evidence on this, in particular, the evidence of transmission after vaccination, as far as we are concerned in the vaccine team. And we are publishing a document with uh, this evidence next week that will be available on our website. Of course, the evidence is along the lines of what Marco said in his presentation. So it is not a black or white situation. It is somewhere there and it needs more data to be able to inform properly about uh, potential actions. Over. Thank you. Um, Kuban, we can still have a few questions. Yeah, thank you. I will read one question which has been received from a member of the European Parliament, from Michelle Rivasi. And uh, she's asking, despite the announcements last week uh, from EMA regarding the uh, safety of AstraZeneca vaccine, some member states are taking actions which uh, may create some confusion because they may differ from country to country. And uh, still we are awaiting uh, that the, 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 the safety committee of the agency will give further recommendations in April. But how can uh, can we comment on how can we address this and which is the best way to address this situation where some member states may take uh, one action which may not necessarily be exactly the same as in another country? Yes, uh, I think I already covered that uh, to a large extent in the in the previous intervention. So uh, I'll perhaps elaborate a little bit more. As I said before, uh, we have a very specific role in in order to ensure that um, uh, the, any new evidence that that we get is being assessed without delay, and that we decide without delay if there is any change to the uh, benefit risk. Of the of the product uh, being it a therapeutic or a, or a vaccine, and that of course we pro uh, properly uh, communicate this and and um, elaborate on the rationale for the, for the decision that that we are making. As I said before, uh, vaccines are a little bit 
different compared to therapeutics that uh, we have to take into account that there are other health organizations at member state level involved on top of the regulatory authorities. Uh, those who are uh, looking into um, into authorizing medicines and that is an aspect that um, has become more and more prominent certainly uh, if member states in the in the context of the rollout of the their national vaccination campaigns where they have to take into account the characteristics at, at member state level what vaccines do they have how many doses etc how do they vaccinate first elderly followed then by healthcare professionals then younger people with underlying disease not underlying disease so the national vaccination campaigns are all quite different so therefore our job is to say to the member states from a benefit risk perspective this vaccine has the necessary quality is safe and it is effective these are the conditions how it should be used and then member states can decide uh, if they how they apply that in the national vaccination campaigns i fully I agree that this may be, be a little bit difficult to understand by the lay public and therefore there is a need in order to uh, to further elaborate on it and to and to make it clear we also have to see how can we reach out not only to the regulatory authorities but to those health authorities who are involved in this kind of decision making make sure that they are fully involved that perhaps we have a closer collaboration with them and that is something that you're currently discussing within the network how to move in that particular direction over to you Juan. Thank you, Noel, to answer that. And I think we can give the floor to uh, Jose Drabbel in the room. Okay, well, thank you very much. Great meeting. But um, I just wanted to ask a question. In um, Scientific American, there was um, um, an article published about the fact that the annual flu shots could actually be um, helping um, against developing um, the COVID. Now, which I find uh, surprising because uh, across Europe, um, so many elderly people have died of COVID and surely that is the age group that would have had the flu vaccination. So I wondered if you have any information or data about this one. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Uh, very difficult to say much in this respect. Of course, uh, vaccination for flu in the elderly has been uh, deemed very important because, of course, uh, you don't want them to get hospitalized uh, or, uh, you know, having symptoms that could be taken by mistake as COVID and therefore, you know, causing more problems. Uh, now, what we've seen uh, is that uh, with uh, all the social distancing measures in place, there has not been a lot of influenza circulating around uh, uh, this year and also in the last month, which is not surprising, not surprising. So clearly all these measures have worked very well for influenza, which really shows also how much this virus is insidious and how important it is that we keep all these measures in place. Uh, in the future, we would expect that uh, vaccination for influenza will resume anyway, and uh, we would expect to see also data maybe with respect to co-administration of a COVID vaccine and an influenza vaccine, because indeed in the elderly protection against both viruses will be very important in limiting the burden of disease. So I don't know if this is, addresses your question as far as I understood. Okay, thank you. Uh, Huan, we can have the two final ones. Yeah. I will read a, a question or comment which has been received from the outside from Jan Lecan from Eurordis. He is um, commenting on the collaboration between EMA and the national authorities, and again commenting on the situation with AstraZeneca, which he reflects may have undermined or affected the trust of the citizens in deficiency and the consistency of the uh, public authorities. So um, he would like to, in, in, in one way, he acknowledged this will raise um, maybe the profile or, or people will know more about EMA, but at the same time, it will put pressure on make EMA more efficient, even than ever, and more publicly accountable. So uh, he, he's reflecting on how we can maybe collaborate better with national authorities to try to improve consistency of messaging. Uh, Fergus, can I give this one to you? Sorry, just on, on doing my, sorry, could you repeat the question? I couldn't hear very well. 
Yes, I mean, the question from Jean Lecam reflects on the fact that um, uh, there is, uh, in, in relation to the situation with AstraZeneca, there, there, there may be a, an issue affecting trust of the citizens on the efficiency and the consistency of the public authorities. And, and he is reflecting how we can improve collaboration with national authorities in order to uh, improve consistency of the messages which are being sent out. Indeed, no, I think we, as, as Noel has said, we, we have a very careful collaboration uh, with, with the, the national competent authorities and member states. And I think also Marco um, may have mentioned, but we, we are in regular contact also with ECDC and the, the NITEX, the National uh, Immunization uh, Advisory Groups. And working together, uh, we can improve the the advice and, and the consistency of communication. I think it's it's very, very important, but clearly individual member states have, have the freedom to, to make decisions, but the more we are able to come together and, and share expert information and do that rapidly uh, and in a consistent manner, that will improve all our uh, ability to communicate consistently, be it on safety issues, uh, issues of efficacy or, or use of, of doses of vaccines, um, so that we, we can have a, a common position across across the union. It's, it's, it's very, very important, but um, it, it takes time to build this. And obviously, uh, we're, we're learning through this rapidly evolving pandemic, um, but I, I think that the communication uh, is improving and we have a lot of context. Thank you. I hope that addresses the question. Thank you, Fergus. So, um, final question. Yeah, we would like to give the floor to Donald Singer in the room. Uh, thank you very much. I really enjoyed the session. My question concerns tools to help policymakers and health professionals and the public about awareness on vaccine hesitancy and measures to nudge or encourage increased acceptance. It might be a question for Melanie Carr at the EMA or at Radio Kotsani at ECDC, but just very briefly, um, I think this, there is very much confusion, for example, in the public mind about for the, these recent reports of thromboses. And I think most public would think about DBT pulmonary embolus. In reality, as Peter has clearly said, it's more these very rare problems, maybe one in a million, but, but nonetheless raising alarm bells. But the, the, the Lancet in, recently in February had a paper where they showed hard line, maybe 30 percent of working age people were against a vaccine in any circumstances with the option to nudge depending on source of vaccine, frequency of serious effects, and confidence in their health professional advice, maybe up to 60%. I'm just wondering to what extent the EMA, EC, EDC could or should be having coordinating role with national agencies and elsewhere to help say more. And for example, having some sort of barometer of confidence that would at least guide what the issues were. It could be live, it could be in different regions. And it might allow you to nudge in different areas for different reasons to help uh, whether it's this current problem, other reasons why people are reluctant to engage with the vaccine program. Thank you. That is a very valid question. So I'll pass on to Melanie and to Eduardo. Yeah, thank you, Donald. It's a very good question. And indeed, I mean, we're working very hard to address concerns and skepticism around vaccination. And, and here, communication and stakeholder engagement are, are really key. Also joining forces is important and working very closely with our partners and within the communication area, we are working very closely with our colleagues at the European Commission, at ECDC and at member state level and monitoring very closely um, the sorts of concerns that are being raised to try and really um, address them as they come up. And I think one thing that's important is about promoting open dialogue. So it's trying to understand those concerns reinforce the trust, not only in the safety and effects, effectiveness, but also in the quality. So people feel, you know, that they, they are informed, they can take well-informed decisions. And as we said, I mean, we have a range of material. Um, we, we're working closely with our patient consumer health professionals working party to, to make sure it's fit for purpose. It helps them um, open up the dialogue with, with their patients, um, with their friends, family groups, et cetera. There's also efforts ongoing at commission level to have strong advocates, so including well-known personalities in the press who can speak out, sharing experience, um, referring people to reputable information sources is very important, reaching out on different media through different age groups, for example. So it's really about getting that dialogue going and, and creating a buzz around vaccination and, and breaking down some of those myths. Over. 
Thank you, Eduardo. Yes, so just to briefly complement, also our communication is highly engaged in this activity and it's very challenging because COVID is different from the usual vaccine hesitancy or vaccine acceptance that with other vaccines where there are more certainties here. As we said, we are in a dynamic situation. There are lots of questions. We are learning as we go because the situation requires that. So also from the point of view of the communication and addressing the concerns is definitely more challenging, but our communication colleagues are really uh, trying hard to, to be able to be on top of these issues. And from the technical perspective, what we are doing is uh, with the National Immunization Technical Advisory Groups, it was mentioned before by Fergus, I think, we are having a collaboration since 2018. And during this pandemic, we are having very frequent webinars where these type of issues, for instance, on safety or on recommendations are shared and discussed. Of course, all the countries are entitled to take their own pathway and, and of course they are welcome to do it. But this possibility of having a platform of sharing and discussing and confronting different views and different uh, interpretation of the actions that need to be taken and experiences as well, is really precious and we are seeing its value that we hope that will rapidly become an asset in terms of be able to have a little bit more harmonized approach to these issues because as it was mentioned if the recommendation go in different directions in different member states this is of course not ideal not easily understood by the citizens sometimes is justified by the context but it needs to be explained very well and it may also uh, give some fuel to some anti-vax group or some conspiracy theorists. So it is really important to have a very strong communication that we are very active in at the national level, at our level, but also at the technical level to be able to exchange and discuss as much as possible the reasons behind the different decisions. Over. Thank you. And so we have come now to the end of the, of the Q&A. So I would like to thank all the panelists for their um, uh, valuable time and for the answers that they have given to the to the questions uh, that have been asked. I would also like to thank uh, Kuman's team for the all the preparation and for the smooth running of this uh, of this meeting. We hope you will be leaving uh, this meeting with a better understanding. It was the third st public stakeholder meeting, and we hope that you will be leaving with a better understanding of how the COVID-19 vaccines have been assessed, how they have been approved, how they are being rolled out and con continuously monitored, and how we as EMA are following up on any new information which emerges once these vaccines are being used. So a couple of messages that you would like to give with you, to you, uh, so that you, before enjoying your weekend, EMA and the network in the EU continues to work to ensure that uh, evaluations are fast and rigorous and so that vaccines can be given as soon as possible to protect EU citizens. We hope you're reassured that the approval of vaccines in the EU is based on a very rigorous process able to provide good evidence of efficacy and safety before these vaccines are given to citizens. All approved vaccines have shown a positive benefit risk and all offer a very good level of protection against COVID-19. We have to remember in this respect that COVID-19 is the worst health, health crisis in a century. And those vaccines offer us hope that we can overcome it. While it's still too early to know the full impact on the, on the pandemic, we are already starting to see some encouraging real-world data on their effect in reducing transmission, severe disease, and hospitalizations. And as the vaccines are now starting to be used widely, a lot of emerging safety data are being generated, rapidly collated, and analyzed. And these data confirm the safety profile of the vaccines as it was described at the moment of their marketing authorization. Most side effects are generally mild and mostly temporary, as has been the case with other vaccines. The public can be reassured that we have a robust system in place, a robust pharmacovigilance system to act swiftly to protect citizens. 
when last week cases of blood clots in people vaccinated with AstraZeneca vaccine were reported, we, over a couple of days, rather than weeks or months, over a couple of days, our safety committee quickly reviewed these and unanimously agreed that the overall benefits of the vaccine still outweigh any risks. However, although we were able to make clear initial recommendations, further studies and close monitoring will continue, including seeking the opinion of other scientists and opinion leaders in the world in case we can find ways to improve safety still more. And we have highlighted to you the steps that will be taken. You can find our press release also on our website with next week, uh, the, uh, an expert meeting followed then by another meeting of our pharmacovigilance risk assessment committee to see if any further changes to the product information will have to be introduced. In this respect, the contributions from patients, from healthcare professionals, and the general public in reporting any side effect and including as much relevant information as possible, as was elaborated upon by Peter, remains critical to achieve our mission to protect public health. We are dependent on the data, the timely submission of the data, and the quality of these data in order to come to inform decision making and to protect public health. Activities like today's meeting aim to convey key information and bring attention to reliable scientific sources such as EMA and ECDC's um, uh, website. We recognize the need for transparency and clarity in fostering trust. And we will continue collaborating. The fight against COVID-19 is a global effort which involves a range of stakeholders, medicine developers, regulators, policy makers, healthcare professionals, and citizens. We all need to work together to combat this pandemic, sharing information and continuing to base our decisions on validated scientific evidence. On a more practical note now, we are stepping up our efforts to inform the public on our activities in relation to COVID-19 and today's stakeholder meeting is one example. As I mentioned to you before the break, have a look at this Slado survey through which you can inform us how we can further improve. It's not yet, uh, there's always a room for improvement. So please help us in making it even more valuable uh, for all of you. Your views are extremely important for us. We have not been able to take all of the comments and questions at this time. However, all of your input will be shared with the relevant people in the different institutions so that they can be considered during our ongoing work. A recording of this meeting will be published on our website in a few days so that everyone can have a look at it who could not watch today. And we hope that we can continue with this type of public meetings and, of course, any feedback that you will provide to us in terms of how to make it even better that we will certainly take into account. And with that, once again, uh, my thanks to all the speakers and, and panelists, my thanks to all of you for your interest and for the questions that you have put. We hope it has been a fruitful exercise and that we have been able in order to provide you more assurance about the fact that the vaccines that are approved are safe and effective. And I wish you a very nice weekend. Thank you and until the next time.